you back. Okay, so our, our next speaker is Dr. Kaylin Baban. Dr. Baban is the first ever Chief Wellness Officer for GW's Medical Enterprise. That's the GW Hospital, Medical Faculty Associates, and School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Dr. Baban is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences and Director of the Lifestyle Medicine Program at GW Medical Faculty Associates. Dr. Baban earned her bachelor's from Columbia University as an I.I. Ravi Science Scholar. He received her MD and MPH from Ikken School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, so now we have two Mount Sinai alums here, as a George James Epidemiology Awardee with Distinction in Research. He completed residency and a chief year in preventative medicine also at Mount Sinai. Dr. Raban is board certified in preventative medicine and lifestyle medicine. Her work addresses mindful provision of holistic, evidence-based, personalized healthcare for prevention, patient empowerment, and optimized health outcomes. I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Raban You should be able to share her screen now. There she is. Hi there, are you able to hear me? Yes, you sound great. Okay, terrific, thank you. And it looks as though, here we are. Okay. So thank you for the introduction, Lee. And I am grateful to have this time today. So um, I will go ahead and just get started. Um, my topic today is the subject of lifestyle medicine as a framework for comprehensive wellness at the GW Wellness Center. So there are a few terms here that I'm going to take a minute to define. Um, wellness, I think those of us in, in this symposium are interested and probably familiar, but I'm just going to take a moment to note that when we speak about wellness, we're really speaking about much more than just the absence of disease. Uh, so this quote that many of us are familiar with from the WHO uh, defines wellness as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. This is for an individual or a group, and they must be able to identify and realize their aspirations, satisfy their needs, and be able to change or cope with the environment. And so there's actually much more here than just um, kind of being being well and, uh, and staying there. So this is a dynamic condition. Uh, it requires the ability to adapt to stressors and changes in the environment um, and the ability to, in another word, um, be resilient uh, to maintain that kind of inner homeostasis. Uh, so there are skills and tools that are required there. Um, there's also a requirement of having some kind of basic level of uh, support in the, uh, in the environment around one or in the culture around one. And what the, all of this really underlines in part is that um, this, is, this is something where we, if we want to support wellness, we want to make sure that we have the tools and environment to do so. We also want to make sure that, yes, we're offering crisis management. That is something that is critically important, but it's not enough. So when we're speaking about lifestyle medicine as a framework for wellness, well, what is lifestyle medicine? Uh, some of you may be familiar with lifestyle medicine. Part of the way in which it can be defined is through these six pillars. So a focus on dietary habits, which would be mostly a whole food plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. Physical activity, so dedicated time for exercise, but also um, movement throughout the day. And this is individualized after all of these pillars to an individual's uh, needs and abilities. Sleep and circadian rhythms, stress management through healthful coping mechanisms social connections and spiritual practices, and the cessation of any unhealthy habits, such as smoking, for example. So good news, about 80% of the health conditions that we see at the GW Medical Faculty Associates every day, about 80% of those health conditions are preventable through lifestyle. That's terrific news. Um, not as great news, uh, one of the markers for how well we're doing here as a society is that actually about 3% of the United States adults actually meet the seven pillars of the um, American Heart Association's Heart Healthy Habits. And <clears throat> that 3% is among the general population. Uh, we know that it's actually a much lower rate uh, for physicians. Physicians as a whole are actually less healthy and less engaged in healthful habits than the general population. And that goes for healthcare workers generally. So, um, 
when we are taking the context of lifestyle medicine and all it can do into account, um, someone might say, well, you know, we have all of these terrific cutting edge um, medications and surgical procedures, and so, you know, maybe it's not such a big problem that we're not doing as much as we can through lifestyle. Uh, so let's take a moment to discuss that. Uh, if we look at uh, annual mortality, causes of mortality in 2016 in the United States, um, the number three cause of mortality in 2016 was actually medical care. And this does not necessarily mean medical care that was um, a case of malpractice or negligence, for example. And in fact, when we look at the breakdown of this number three cause, the number one reason for uh, an iatrogenic um, death it's an adverse drug effect that was not an error. So the drug was prescribed appropriately, it was taken appropriately, but we know that some percentage of people who are taking medications are going to have a poor outcome, and that's what's happened uh, for the number one cause of these iatrogenic uh, deaths. So am I anti-medication? No, and neither is lifestyle medicine. Um, do I believe in surgical procedures where we need them? Yes, absolutely, and I'm grateful to have them when we do need them. Uh, but maybe we should be thinking twice about having medications and surgical procedures be our first step, our first line. And just another indication here that perhaps we want to be taking closer look at lifestyle as a means for addressing uh, our health conditions as a society and as individuals. Um, we see this great downward trend in cardiovascular mortality in the United States over the years. And as we can start to see here, a little bit of an uptick towards the end. And that uptick is and identifi identifies the fact that we are having a crisis of lifestyle in the United States and have been for decades. So we are spending a lot of time in most medical settings really taking care of the downstream effects of having just 3% of our population really fully engage with a healthful lifestyle. So wouldn't it be terrific if we could go more towards the root cause? In conventional medicine, um, in the way that Dr. Dudley was describing earlier, um, much of the attention really comes kind of farther down the line in a way that's very highly specialized, perhaps just a dermatologist, just a gastroenterologist. This we often think about as kind of higher level care. And again, grateful to have it when we need it, but wouldn't it be terrific if we could head off a lot of those cases that we see before they get there? And so that's where lifestyle medicine focuses, is really more towards prevention of a health condition developing in the first place, or to take a look at, okay, now that we have this developed, what can we do through first-line treatments involving lifestyle to manage and um, ideally reverse these conditions? So again, lifestyle medicine philosophy, we put the first-line therapies first. This is an evidence-based approach, very patient-centered because we need to individualize these approaches for them to work. And we're really looking at root causes. This quote comes from um, the journal Preventive Medicine. Um, the best kept secret in medicine is that given the right milieu, the body heals itself. Um, you may start to see a connection here between the lifestyle medicine philosophy regarding physical health and maybe some of the ways in which we could speak about emotional health, um, wellness, and resilience. So to make this transition, uh, we know that burnout is rampant among physicians in the United States, among non-physician healthcare providers, and, and really among individuals who are working in a healthcare setting, regardless of whether or not they're clinical. So there are some inherent aspects of the healthcare system that can cause burnout as one marker for this lack of wellness. Uh, these are high-stakes environments. The expectations are constantly increasing, changing, that are sometimes, frankly, unrealistic. There are aspects of work that don't feel that meaningful uh, and doesn't contribute to that sense of kind of mission and drive to be invested in the work. And individuals often feel a kind of low sense of self-efficacy. Uh, there are a lot of physical challenges, uh, infringement of personal life, um, and the social interactions when you are in a high-stress environment um, can sometimes not be terrific. So why does this matter? It's unpleasant, but why does it matter? We, I think, are all familiar with some of these statistics. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we know that um, healthcare providers generally, when they are experiencing burnout or other states of a lack of wellness, 
are prone to many different health outcomes that we do not want to see. And I apologize, that looks like it's a little bit digitized, but essentially this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, the doctor is saying what seems to be the problem, uh, the patient saying, well, I feel the way that you look. Um, we want to avoid this, but unfortunately, um, this is actually a reality that we are experiencing sometimes in one way or another, and, um, and not infrequently is what the data show us. So, what can we do about this? There are a number of wellness programs all across the United States and academic medical centers, and um, our group here at GW did a survey of about 16 of the most prominent uh, programs across the country and found that there were some common elements. We saw buy-in from leadership, if you're going to have a successful program, is really critically important. Addressing culture, having broad definitions of wellness. So um, there are a plethora of programs that will look at uh, one specific aspect of wellness. So let's encourage our employees to move more, or you know, let's try to bring more helpful foods into the cafeteria, um, or we're going to develop you know, a mindfulness program. All of those things are terrific, uh, but they're looking at really just one particular aspect of wellness. And if that particular aspect is not what someone needs or is not something that resonates with them, the amount of good that it can do for them is really limited. Flexibility is really critical. Uh, we know that each individual really is the expert on what they need to support their own wellness. And if we're able to be flexible to the extent possible, and allow individuals the opportunity to pursue their own support, their own wellness, usually that, that is what's going to work out best. And to have a really data-driven approach. Uh, so these are some of the things that we have seen in common. So what are some workplace cultures that we know can really promote well-being? So let's dive down on that question of culture a little bit more. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of these. This is a partial list. There's a lot of data and big body literature here that's very interesting if you want to take a look at it. Um, but there are a couple of areas that I really want to highlight here. So one is that the environment provides the necessary tools, infrastructure, and opportunities for self-efficacy. So that's kind of building on that concept of allowing flexibility where possible. Um, so creating enough flexibility and opportunity for self-efficacy, but also really providing the tools and resources that one can use to take advantage of that flexibility. And a recognition of personal wellness as being really foundational for one's individual professional wellness and uh, for the institution as a whole uh, to be doing the best that it can be. And these are a couple of areas that I'd like for us to drill down a little bit more. So, where we are at GW is really investigating this idea of using lifestyle medicine in particular as an explicit framework for our wellness initiatives. Uh, this is something that we are, to my knowledge, uh, first in doing in, in, among an academic medical center or, or really any other organization that I'm familiar with. And the idea for doing this, um, you may have uh, caught on to in the previous slides is that what, what we see here is that really we have two fundamental challenges to our healthcare system uh, in this country, and I think we could say probably at least in most of the industrialized world, of really entwined, of a really entwined nature. And so we've been speaking about these two different phenomena. One, um, stress, burnout, associated physical and emotional health crises or just lack of wellness among people working in a healthcare environment, on the one hand. On the other, we've also been speaking about this epidemic of chronic illnesses. I realize epidemic is a loaded word these days, but truly it is an epidemic of chronic illnesses that are caused or substantially exacerbated by lifestyle. And this is among the patients that we treat across all medical specialties and really across any type of healthcare setting. We tend to speak about and, and think about these two phenomena as though they are separate. Uh, but in truth, I think if we look at them more closely and we will see some of the literature that supports this, I think they're actually really very closely related and um, end up feeding one another. And the shared root cause here, I would postulate, is that there is a culture that insufficiently supports and promotes wellness. And this is particularly true in a healthcare setting, but I think we could argue it's probably true in our society in the United States more broadly. So provider and patient wellness 
uh, I would argue here are really two facets of the same phenomenon. So some of the evidence that supports this. If we look at patients who have been counseled to practice helpful behaviors, um, when they are counseled to do so, they're much more likely to implement those behaviors than if they just do it on their own. So if I tell one of my patients, you know, we really need to get you moving more, we need to make some adjustments in the way that you're eating, and we kind of explore that a little bit, um, there may be, there may be, and there probably are going to be some details of that conversation that may be news to them, um, some more research in the literature, something that's particularly relevant for their underlying health conditions. Uh, but the general idea that they should be eating healthfully and exercising is probably not news to them. Why does me talking to them about that make a difference? It makes a difference because it's a recommendation coming from a healthcare provider, and we know that sometimes that's really all it takes to really make a significant difference in behavior. Um, so let's take a look then at who's most likely to be counseling regarding these healthful behaviors. Uh, it's really the healthcare providers who practice those behaviors themselves. Um, if I don't tend to practice these healthful behaviors, I'm much less likely to counsel my patients on them. And even if I am not a practitioner myself, but I believe that it's important and I counsel my patients on it, there is good evidence that shows that my counsel will not be as effective in actually moving the needle on that patient's behavior if I do not practice these behaviors myself than if I did. Um, so that's one way in which these two things are very clearly intertwined. Um, if we look at self-care and mind-body, um, there's a variation on this theme. So healthcare providers who practice self-care regularly, um, who are engaged in mindfulness practice regularly, experience less stress, less burnout, and are prone to fewer medical errors. Again, a big body of literature that demonstrates this. Um, on the flip side, um, patients who are counseled by those providers um, by those providers who they perceive as more mindful. Um, those patients are more adherent to their management plans and they end up having better health outcomes. So again, um, we can't really extricate healthcare provider wellness from patient wellness. These are really deeply entwined. And, and so how do we take how do we take that knowledge and build off of it to build a more effective program? So this is the framework that we um, that I have proposed and that we have been using at GW is to lose, use lifestyle medicine, an evidence-based personalized approach to health and wellness, embracing those six pillars that we had discussed earlier as a means to support our community of scientists and healthcare providers, um, as well as our staff, our trainees, to actively pursue and maintain our own best wellness and to do this in a means that allows us to more effectively prepare and counsel our community of patients. So um, when we kind of first set forth this proposal to create what we're now calling the GWELL Center for Healthcare Professionals, um, we weren't starting from scratch. Uh, GW as an institution has been around for a while, and uh, there were a number of existing resources across the partner institutions that make up the GW medical enterprise that offered a broad scope of wellness programs. Uh, and those programs were a really good start, but they were very siloed. And what that ended up meaning was that there were a lot of duplicated efforts, there were a lot of unmet needs, and there wasn't really a unifying vision, uh, nor was there a single source that any one individual could go to to see what was available or what was being done. Um, so ours was also the first proposal uh, for a academic medical center in the United States to have a wellness program that was targeting not just our providers and providers in training, uh, but also our non-physician faculty, our non-clinical staff, and our alumni. With the idea here that we know that community and culture are critically important, and if we are singling out just a certain subset of our population, there really isn't any way for us to meaningfully move the needle on the culture and build a real sense and meaningful sense of community. Uh, so this is all relatively new. We had our inaugural meeting of our Wellness Advisory Council last January with representatives from each of those constituent populations that I just mentioned. Uh, set up a number of working groups that um, have been doing very good work, and I've been grateful to have the opportunity to collaborate with. And um, broadly speaking, uh, this is what we've done. We have been using uh, within this lifestyle medicine framework 
um, a model that is developed by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, for these eight dimensions of wellness. So we can make sure that we're really keeping as broad a possi as possible a definition of what does it mean to be well. And keeping these in mind as we consider all of the resources that we're developing for, this well for these wellness programs and for a really comprehensive wellness initiative. Uh, so as I mentioned, we've been targeting all of the members of our academic medical enterprise um, with a combination of resources that are kind of core, so to speak, um, that are part of someone's daily or weekly or monthly routine, regardless of whether they actively seek it out or not. So this is perhaps in the core curriculum for our medical students. Um, for the residents, we were actually the first internal medicine residency program to offer a lifestyle medicine experience for our residents, um, which many of them told us uh, really ended up influencing their behaviors, uh, not just with their patients, but also for themselves, which of course is the intention. Um, looking at things like uh, orientation programs for uh, new staff as they're onboarding, looking at um, trainings for managers, and then offering some optional classes that anyone who's interested in more can seek out. And developing some infrastructure. So um, we've been lucky to have Dr. Lee Frame as a member of our Speakers Bureau. We have been working on developing some policies and guidelines, which I'll touch on in a minute, some uh, toolkits for supervisors, and are also working on developing peer-to-peer -peer support, which I will be uh, expanding on in a moment. So, um, I, I won't go through our whole mission statement, but the idea here is really that we're looking to create an environment that really supports and promotes health and wellness for all of the members of our community, and that does this um, through a broad concept of wellness by supporting the development of skills, either by developing resources where needed or curating outside resources where they're already available, and promoting leadership, uh, excuse me, providing leadership for a structural approach, realizing that um, an individual can do everything that they can and follow all the best practices, but we need to address uh, organizational and structural wellness as well. So these are some of the elective resources that we've developed over the course of the past year or so. Um, these are continuing to grow and certainly change given the current environment. Um, so with the current environment in mind, um, I'll give you a brief update on what we've been doing just in the past few weeks. Um, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic, this novel coronavirus pandemic, raises some particularly challenging issues uh, in, a, in, in an environment that was already a difficult one for wellness. So a lot of disruption to usual rules and routines, uh, adjustments to new workflows, new responsibilities, a great deal of uncertainty, um, limited understanding of the environment and pathogen that we are dealing with, and a lot of concern for the individuals around us and it, frankly for ourselves. So how is uh, the GWELL Center for Healthcare Professionals responding? Uh, in the last several weeks, um, we've been working um, to really make sure that we are turning everything around and adapting the resources that we have for the current need. So that has meant building, curating, amplifying some evidence-based resources, again, using those pillars of lifestyle medicine and making sure that we are tapping each of those, uh, recognizing that all of them are important, particularly when we are dealing with a high stress crisis environment uh, that is likely to be going on for quite a while. So trying to find ways in which we can provide resources that individuals can modify to support all of those six pillars uh, and trying to make sure that we are also at the same time uh, providing trainings for managers and leaders so that they can help to create an environment in which individuals do have access to and flexibility to continue to support their own needs, uh, as well as having support from their leadership. So I know we as a time check, I think that we've got just about 10 minutes left, is that right? Okay, I'm going, I'm going to think that that's a yes. So, um, Correct. so some of, okay, great, thank you. Um, so some of what we've been working on here has been making sure that there is an open conversation about um, the importance of self-awareness, kind of self-monitoring, um, recognizing that stress is not always a bad thing. It can be beneficial uh, and makes, in, in an environment like this, it can help us make sure that we are doing what we need to do to keep ourselves protected 
um, but also recognizing that instead of just pushing through the stress, particularly in a crisis that is going to be ongoing, we want to make sure that we are recognizing it and then using tools available to bring it down, um, whether those tools are ones that we are deploying ourselves or that we're seeking out help from others. And um, we have been spending time also thinking about what are the evidence-based predictors of workplace wellness? How do we make sure that we can really fully take advantage of these and make sure that we are leveraging them to our benefit during the time of crisis? So as most healthcare institutions these days, um, having a clear sense of organizational mission is not really a challenge any longer. Um, making sure that each employee does have a clear sense of their own role in advancing that mission can be more difficult, especially as those roles are constantly evolving. So this is part of what we've been working on is really related to the third bullet of transparent two-way communication. Uh, we've been talking about really practical steps uh, with our uh, managers and leadership to make sure that um, they are, they really have the tools that they need to best support the individuals working under them. Um, now, this is a, um, an initiative that we had been developing anyway, but um, has been moved up and really specifically tailored now to this current period of crisis. Um, the importance of relationships in the workplace, even when these are kind of brief empathic encounters, a great deal of evidence that it makes a very big difference to the individuals around the person who is initiating those encounters as well as for the individual themselves. Um, so those relationships with leaders appear to be particularly important, but the relationships with really anyone in the workplace, even if it's just a brief kind of eye contact, smile, kind of genuine inquiry of how someone is, uh, something as small as that really makes a big difference for both parties involved. We've been making sure, as I said, to um, address all of the pillars. So we've been speaking about you know, stress management and social relationships. We've also been touching on physical wellness through uh, physical activity, dietary habits, sleep, um, social community outside of work, which we know is really critically important and has become more challenging now as a result of social distancing. And the special issues of individuals who are working from home. We realize that um, members of our community, some of them are front lines, some of them are supporting those individuals, and some have roles that are evolving and perhaps not really quite clear even at this point a few weeks in. And each of those groups as individuals has different needs. We've been trying to make sure that we're addressing, uh, particularly speaking to each of those communities. And so going forward from this point, um, Specifically with regard to the coronavirus pandemic that we are experiencing now, we do anticipate that the need uh, for these wellness initiatives uh, is going to grow in volume and intensity as it will be across, across uh, healthcare organizations and very likely across the United States, um, across the world. So in response, some of the things that we are working on here is really accelerating the peer-to-peer -peer support structure. Uh, across populations with the expectation and, and knowledge at this point that we, we are not currently equipped with enough mental health providers, enough mental health professionals. We know that there's a great deal of evidence that peer-to-peer -peer support can make a significant difference and are working on um, continuing to develop and accelerate that program so we can get it launched quickly. Uh, we are also seeking to grow um, our cadre of professional mental health providers, professional mental health support, uh, which is going to require um, um, creative funding. <laughs> um, continuing the dialogue with our managers and leaders, recognizing that best practices are important and making sure that they have the tools and resources that they need to accomplish that, but also um, continuing our work with policies and guidelines uh, to particularly make sure that those evidence-based best practices are, are codified there to the extent possible. Um, Dr. Frame has been a champion for our self-care methods and healthcare providers course, uh, which we are in the process of adapting to be a self-paced online course in order to be able to disseminate that kind of throughout the community. Um, working on continuing to collect and hopefully collect more in-depth um, quantitative and qualitative data to help us identify where there are unmet needs or un, uh, unidentified subpopulations, realizing that everyone's experience is so different and there may be some cohorts whose needs we are, are not on our radar. Uh, and continue to advocate for a broadened inclusion of these skills and tools uh, of lifestyle medicine and wellness into these core experiences for all of the members of our community uh, so that we can be prepared from the get-go instead of needing to kind of retrofit when the time arrives. 
So um, there are many inherent aspects of a healthcare environment that can really undermine um, the best, um, best practices of wellness for everyone. Uh, for our providers, for the non-providers working in these settings, uh, and for patients. We know that there are a number of comprehensive and evidence-based strategies that can really reduce um, individual crises and can increase well-being for individuals and for institutions. Um, and those institutional pieces, I think, are particularly important, taking the onus off the shoulders of the individual. So there are some key practices here that we have been really particularly um, going after, making sure that we are offering peer support where possible, building up supervisor skills, um, developing more access and opportunity, um, some of that through providing resources, some of it through addressing things like policies and guidelines. And the time that we are living through now really makes the support uh, even more important. Um, so I will just close there uh, with the thought that 